Opposite means the negative, right? In, in numbers, opposite. Well, then you just opposite like two negatives. Huh? You put the four on top and two on bottom. Okay. We were closer when you said the opposite. I would just say that the word opposite is a little confusing, maybe. So, what did you say you would do? What did you say you would do with it? You would, you would take them and do what with them? Multiply them. Multiply them and get what? One. Okay, so if you multiply a number by its multiplicative inverse, you get? One. Yes, you get one. Okay. So, what number can you multiply negative three-fourths by to get one? Yep. Negative four thirds. Excellent. If we want to get one, which is positive, if we just say one is positive, we definitely have to multiply by a negative. And just the reciprocal of a number will cancel the numerator, will cancel the denominator, and vice versa. Four, four, three, three, they cancel each other, or you get 12 over 12, that's going to be one. And so we just multiply by, well, the reciprocal of the same sign. All right. So, like we said, the, another name of it is the reciprocal. So, it becomes a little bit prob problematic with this guy right here because we can't just say the reciprocal of this. It's a mixed number. How do we, how do we fix that? How do we make it not a mixed number? Uh. Steven? What's one and one third? Uh, okay. That's the re that's the inverse. The multiplicative oh, inverse. Okay. So we find the multiplicative inverse. How about do that? Step me through how you find your this multiplicative inverse. Yeah. Well, just on number nine, right? Yeah, on this one. Um, oh, to okay. make it a uh, mixed num uh, mix number, you would eight times three times four and plus one. Okay, so three times four, and then you add one, and you get negative, well, three times four is 12, plus one is 13, so negative 13 thirds. Who can explain why that works? Why does that take four and a third and turn it into 13 thirds, and that actually is a thing? Trevor? Because if you divide uh, three into 13, then uh. it'll turn out to negative one third. Or ne Four and a third. <laughs> Sorry, I can't talk. True, that, but that assumes like you already know. That's like, um, that lets us know that it's right, that we did yeah. it right. Oh, that's, that's but really like how, 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 what is the explanation for this? Why do we multiply three? It, like it's not a, a magic trick, right? Three times four plus one gets you magically the answer. Why does that, why, why does that definitely produce an improper fraction that's equal to four and a third? up with that? Why would you multiply three by four? Then why would you add that one? Derek? Because if you can divide 13 by three and you go in one left over, or not four with one left over. I mean, that's what Trevor said, isn't it? Hmm? That about what you said, Trevor? That's to prove, that, that can prove to us that we did it right, right? But that's not why that works. Like, what, what's really going on? Did you have something, Cody? Uh, no. You did it? Yeah. Okay, same thing there. Somebody else over here? Raise their hand. We multiply three times four, and then we add one. What's that about? Okay. Um, well, I kind of thought more as um, when you do it, you three only goes into four once. Okay. So three goes into four once. So that's the one, and then I don't know if I'm saying. 
What's the one? This one? Oh, wrong problem. Oops. Oh, wrong problem. Okay. Sorry. I was... That's all right. We've multiplied three times four and we've added one. Okay. If we don't know why that works, why that is, we really should. If there's something that you're doing and it seems like magic, you should stop and think, this seems like magic and I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to ask someone and have them explain it to me. Math should not be magic. There should not be tricks that you do and that's all you know. Okay? Okay, well. Um, multiplying 3 times 4, what does 3 times 4 give us? 12. What if we divide 12 by 3? What we get? 4. 4. Okay, there's something there. Uh, Let's see, we, we added something to one, right? Well, really, in reality, you could only add something to one, right, which is part of one third. You could only add something to one third, let's say, if you had what? You're gonna add one third to something? What does this need to have? A common denominator. That's something to think about, okay? What did we add up adding to one? One plus, what was it? It was 12, so we must in reality have added 12 thirds. Does that make sense? I'm going to add something to the numerator of a fraction. It must come from another fraction that actually had a denominator that was the same. What does it make sense that we're adding 12 thirds? So we got 1 third plus 12 thirds. Mesh with four and one third. Okay, why? Uh, uh, because four times three is twelve. Plus four. True. That that just seems to me like we already did <coughs> four and, and we heard twelve and then there's twelve again and so you know that sounds familiar. Right? Yeah. But I mean, is, is 12 thirds plus 1 third the exact same thing as 4 and a third? Uh, yeah. Is it? Yeah. It's, it's in the same problem. <coughs> 12 thirds is in the Okay. It's in the Okay, there we go. 12 divided by 3 is 4. Right. So this is 4 and this is 1 third. Is this just 4 plus 1 third? No. It's not? What is it? Four times one. This is four times one third. Yeah. Let's look at four times one third. Four times one third. Multiply straight across, we get four thirds. No, oh. I guess I'll find it. Okay. Now, it, it makes sense. There's a four next to a one third. There's a number right next to another number. A lot of times we multiply numbers that are sitting right next to each other. Right? You see all this stuff is a little weird? We're talking about all these agreements that we're making, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> in this instance, when I write a number next to another number, it's understood that it's, well, it's four and a little more. How much more? A third. a third. What's that? That's addition. Four and another third. We're adding them together. Okay, even though it looks like a lot of times uh, numbers right next to each other are multiplication. So what we have is really four plus another third. So if we're going to combine them into one fraction, we would need to have 4 over 1 be a fraction that has a common denominator with 1 third. So we need to come get a common denominator of 3. Instead of doing that every time, though, what's going to happen? Well, the whole number is going to need to have the same denominator as the fraction. The denominator is always going to be the denominator that you see. The denominator this is going to have is always going to be this. Well, what's going to happen when you turn 4 over 1 into something over 3? You're going to multiply this by 3, and you'll multiply this by 3. You're just always going to multiply this whole number by whatever this denominator is. Okay, and we get 12 thirds. And we add one more third, we get a total of 13 thirds. Please, if I could, like, is it, is it possible to get through your math classes just knowing the tricks? Possibly. Um, you, you can pass them. Um, 
But if you if you let too many of those pile up, these magic tricks that you don't understand, they all start to get all jumbled together. They all are swimming around in your memory, and your memory is this terrible thing. Memories are just not strong. Okay. Um, there's tricks that we can do for our memories, to, but we just lose what the meaning of it all is. Okay. So if you find yourself just using a, a magic trick, a little just do this and just do that and just do this, and you hope you did the steps right because you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes, I would encourage you in math and in every walk of life, try and learn those things that you don't understand. Like maybe a couple times in your life, don't just take your car and give it to the guy at Walmart and have him change the oil. Maybe understand what oil's for figure out or learn some how to change your own oil, okay, so that you can diagnose, them. what's that? I said I don't have a car. don't have a car, well someday maybe you'll have a car, and uh, you know, maybe it's it's faster to take it to, the, to Jiffy Lube or whatever and have that guy do it, and you can afford to pay that guy to do it. Um, it's cheaper to do it yourself, so you can save some money, it helps you to understand things about your car, understand what oil does, what happens to your engine when there's not enough oil in it, what it sounds like, what it smells like, okay? And it can save you a lot of money if you could diagnose a problem like that, right? So just an analogy for learning how something works and it actually benefiting you. So be careful. If you're doing a lot of this stuff, pick one and start picking it apart and understanding why that little thing works. Okay. So anyway, that number is negative 13 thirds as an improper fraction. But the whole thing we were trying to do anyway was find this multiplicative inverse thing. So what's the multiplicative inverse of negative 13 thirds, and why is it the multiplicative inverse? I heard a really quiet whisper or something I think was the answer. Negative 3 thirteenths? Okay. Well, why is it negative 3 thirteenths and not just 3 thirteenths? Well, because there's a negative, I mean... To get to equal 1, you have to do a negative times a negative, which equals positive. Because, yes, exactly. What we're doing with this multiplicative inverse to show that it is the multiplicative inverse is multiply it and get positive 1. So if it was just 3 over 13, wouldn't we get 1? No, we negative one. We know that the result needs to be positive one, so negative three thirteenths is the thing that we use. So negative three thirteenths. There it is. That's it. All right. Yeah, so I'm sorry. If we have it wrong on our homework while we're doing this, can we fix it? Or sure. do you want yeah, fix it. Because like I said, the, the, the homework I don't use, I, I just grade that you did your homework. You did it. Because as we talked about, homework is time for you to try. So if you didn't know how to do it on your homework, I'm not going to penalize you because you didn't know how to do it at the time that you were just practicing something. Okay? It should, let me, I'll, I'll walk you through my whole philosophy. Because it's, it's a sound one and it's one that I've thought through. I've spent many, many hours agonizing over what's the best way to do this. And what we have right now is kind of a, a hybrid what I think is best, and you know, other factors. Okay, so you get this stuff in class, you get this new information, and then you go home, and it's time to do the homework. Okay, classically, homework is taken and graded for accuracy. But that doesn't seem very fair to me because the grade in the class is supposed to reflect that you know something, and when you're on your homework doing stuff. I don't know about you, but when I was doing my homework, I didn't always necessarily know what I was doing. If I just knew what I was doing, it would be ridiculous for me to give you homework just so that you did it. Right? You can just say that it got done. Okay? The purpose of doing homework is to highlight things that you don't know, really. Okay? If, uh, if I gave you homework on multiplication tables, it would be just really ridiculous dumb for me to give you that in an algebra class. Okay. Unless 
you were having trouble with your multiplication tables, then it'd be great to sit down and practice them and see if you're doing them right or if you're doing them wrong. And the things that you already know, it's pointless for me to give you homework. I give you homework on things that you probably don't understand fully. So if you're using your homework time properly, what you're doing is you're using it as a time to find out things you don't know. You're forcing yourself to sit there and try it, work it out, and you're realizing, oh, I saw him do it in class, but I didn't understand it, and I'm only realizing that now. Well, I got a whole spiel. Just hold up. Just hold that thought. Okay? We'll come back. So that's what I would hope you would do, okay? That doesn't always happen. Or you think you're doing that. You think you're practicing. You think you're getting some information about what you know and what you don't. That you're actually you're getting this false sense of security. So that's what I had you come in here, and I force you to try it on your own, without any help, without any cues, without anything. And then you find out, I really did know what I was doing, or I'm surprised to learn that I didn't know how to find the multiplicative inverse. I didn't know how to divide two fractions. Right, because maybe you're trying to divide two fractions, you kept looking back at your notes, you back at your book, and it kept telling you how to do it. You say, okay, I can do that to this problem. But without any cues and without any help, do you know what you're supposed to do? Nope. Even better, can you justify it? Right? And if you're learning that, you're learning, I'm approaching my homework probably in the wrong way. I'm just trying to get it done, and I don't see it as a time for me to learn anything. Okay? To understand that there are things that I don't get. All right? So that's why this is it. All right? Additionally, I don't know who did your homework. Really, if we think about it honestly, you could have done it, your friend could have done it, you could have copied it off your friend, your parents could have helped you excessively so that it's not really representative of your work. So even if I were to grade it for accuracy, I'm not sure that it's all your work. So we come here and do the quiz. That's all you. I know it's all you. I know it's what you know or what you don't. Okay? Um, so there's that. What's your question? Connor? What was your um, Uh, it's a completion grade. Make sure that you did it. I look at the problems and see that you tried them out. And I'm not going to give credit to number 12, answer number 12. But I know number 12 is going to take some more work that you didn't show. You know what I'm saying? I wish you had more problems on the quiz. I wish you had more problems on the quiz? Yeah. Why? Because then you know what we're doing. You know what you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> These are samples of the tap that's I took on. Never mind. I just scratch that for you. Uh, and part of it is up to you. If we get done with the quiz and you're still confused, and I say, are there any questions? And you just sit there because you're in a big class and you don't want to ask a question that you think you're the only one who's confused about it. No. That's okay. But then you got to come in and you got to ask questions outside of class. Some of it should be on you. That's, that's reasonable. If you're really interested in learning this stuff, you're going to ask questions. You're not going to let confusion go by. Right. Um, OK. So there's all that. So we're going to divide a fraction by another fraction. Okay, dividing a fraction by a fraction is a, a strange proposition. How do I divide something into 5 thirds groups? I don't know really what that means. But it sure would be a, a lot easier to instead of divide by a fraction, do what? Multiply by the reciprocal. The reciprocal of what? The denominator. Which one's the denominator? The one on the bottom. The one on the bottom. Well, there's not really a bottom here, right? There's a left and right. So one on the right. If you were to write it vertically, this one would wind up on the bottom. It would be the denominator. So again, we know that we multiply by 3 fifths. We can cancel cancellation between those two threes, and we get negative one fifth. But maybe that's just a trick that you're learning. You learned to multiply by the reciprocal and memorize it, and never really thought, why can I magically flip over that thing and multiply by it? So quickly again, negative one third. If we write it vertically, okay, now we can use our knowledge of fractions. I can multiply the denominator and the numerator of a fraction by what? Reciprocal, in fact, by anything, right? Numerator, denominator, at least by the same thing. So if I choose cleverly enough 
to multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator, and we get cancellation here. So now all of this is over what? Zero. One. One, yeah, that's it. One. And when you divide by one, nothing changes. So now this problem becomes negative one third times three fifths. Times three fifths. And there we go, the same problem is over there. So negative six plus 15 over six, we're gonna simplify that. What is the simplified version of this? Just a simplified version of this fraction. version of this story is that if you're going to, let's, let's look at another problem and then we'll say like, oh, I see the connection between those two things. Okay, you go over here, three times, let's just say negative six P plus 15. Okay, totally different problem. Not the same, not related to that except for we just happen to use the same uh, negative six P plus five expression, or 15, sorry. So, but otherwise, completely unrelated to that except for this concept we're trying to pull out of it. If I want to multiply this three by the parentheses, what do I do with this three? Just with this one word. Distribute. So multiplication distributes across every term in the, you know, in the expression, in the parentheses. Okay. Well, multiplication and division are just two sides of the same coin. Multiplication and division. Division is just multiplication by the reciprocal. Right. So they are, they're in the same ballpark. They're in fact the same exact thing. Okay. So if multiplication distributes across everything in an expression, then across this expression, this division should distribute to here and to here and to any other term that you see. Okay. So you can write it like this. Negative 6p over 6 plus 15 over 6. Same exact thing. You can think of it this way. Here's a fraction. Here's a fraction. And what do these two fractions have in common? The denominator, if I add them together, hey, look, that's what I'll get. I'll add the numerators together. The denominator will stay 6. Okay. Just like we took those to sum of two fractions and split them apart. Both of them have a denominator of 6. So I could do it this way. What's negative 6p divided by 6 now? What's that? Negative 1p. Negative 1p. Yes? And 15 divided by 6. Can we simplify that at all? We have common factors. Three, come factor three. Five, two, five halves. Okay. That works great. And let's say for now, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Maybe later on in the year, I'll go back over that whole common factor explanation. We'll just stay with that. Division needs to be applied to everything in the parentheses. This is, this is in parentheses, right? It's grouped together. That's what parentheses do. These things are grouped together by virtue of the fact that they're in the numerator together. They make up the numerator. So this division by 6 needs to apply to that and to that, Hildy. Um, I don't know what it did wrong on that one. Well, I know. I don't. Now here's a, another acceptable answer, uh, the one that I would probably get myself, I would say, well, if I write this like this, is this the same as this? If you do what with this three? How do I get from this? To this. Yeah. Distribute. Distribute the 3, I get negative 6p plus 15, right? 
And now there's a factor of 3 and a factor of 3, negative 2p plus 5 over 2. So that's simplified as well, but I've just left it as a single fraction. Right. Or I could then just further divide this by 2 and divide this by 2, I'd wind up with the exact same thing as this. Anyway, I'd be glad to see you do that either way. So these quizzes, I feel like, are a good representation of the kinds of things we did in the homework. And I would, it's my opinion that it represents all those different types of problems. But if you feel like there's something in your homework that this quiz didn't address and didn't make clear, that would be the time is now to ask a question about a different problem that you're still not sure about. Derek? So I have a question for yeah. number seven. Yeah. When it's when like the reciprocal is four over three. Yeah. Do we change that to a mixed number? Uh, oh, I don't care. Okay. Um, which, from having heard my explanation, which do you think I would say like, that I would use? Or my answer would be. Mm -hmm. I should, I should What's that? I think you said improper fraction. Yeah, I would leave it as a, as a quote, improper fraction. That's the only term we have. I would say, I don't know, just in fraction form, just not mixed number. Because, again, if you leave it as a mixed, or as you, if you leave it as an improper fraction, it's a one number over the other. And that's the only way you can use fractions to interact with other fractions. If I want to add it to a fraction, I need a two fractions with common denominators. If I want to multiply two fractions together, I, we immediately take things from mixed numbers to improper fractions to use them. <coughs> So that's why I leave it as a improper. But they're the same number, so I can't, in good conscience, mark you wrong for that. Right? Even though I hate it, if, I, if the answer is, um, say, 3 fourths, and, and we got that by doing calculations with fractions, I really want you to do that because I really want you to understand fractions so that when there's just no getting around it anymore, you're ready to go. You can do fractions. But if you answer it at 0.75, they're the exact same number, 3 fourths and 0.75. I can't mark you wrong for that. The only time I'll mark you wrong is if I specifically ask you, please write the answer as a fraction in the lowest form, okay, really specifically. So if there's some kind of preference that I have about how you answer, I'll, I'll be specific. Okay. Um, any other questions from some other part of the homework? Quiz? Whatever. Can you ask a question? I have to go to Mary's. Do you want me to wait till he gets back? Uh, no. Thank you. All right, let's pass in the homework then. Thank you.
Okay, 2.7 now. you'll get A. That's what it means to say that B is the square root of A. That's the definition of thing. Why? What's the, why? Why is it necessary to talk through this? I'm sorry. Okay. B squared is A. That's what it means to say that B is the square root of A. You can, square, you can multiply by itself and you'll get A. Oh. Um, so in a square root, this thing is called the radical. Okay. It's just a name for that symbol. It's not called the square root symbol, though that's probably what people will call it if you talk to them in everyday life, and that's fine, it works. Um, but it's called the radical, and that's why it's not so weird that this guy the radical, that's right. The radical, what's in the radical is the radical. So that's called the radical, like parentheses are called parentheses. So just the name for that thing. All right, so here's, here's kind of a deep question. What kinds of numbers can be the radical? Or think about the, the opposite side of that. What numbers cannot be? be the radicand? Huh? Whole numbers. Are they okay or they're not okay? They're okay. They're okay. Give me an example of a whole number that's okay to have in there. Four. Four. Square root of four is? Two. Works. Two. Okay, it works. Okay, whole numbers. What about square root of seven? Is that okay? It's not okay. It's okay. He says it's okay, like the square root of seven exists. Does it exist? Okay, you said the square root of seven does not exist. There just is no square root of seven. Okay, well, now a square is just a number that if you multiply it by itself, you get the original radicand. Right? So, well, let's look at this. What's the square root of four? 
And what's the square root of 9? 3. three. Right? And between 4 and 9 is 7, seven right? Three. 7. So if the square root of 9 equals 3 and the square root of 4 equals 2, and here's the square root of 7, right in between there, what can we assume about the square root of 7? Maybe it's 2.5. Maybe it's 2.3. Uh, Three, six, nine, seven, five, whatever. It's between two and three. It's going to quiet down the side conversation. So it's somewhere between, finish it, two and three. Two and three. Somewhere between two and three. Okay. We don't know what it is exactly. And in fact, to say what it is exactly in, in normal terms, like two point something, is, uh, well, take forever. Let's just use our calculators to help us out for a second. Think about this. Okay, so we put in the square root of seven, it's 2.645. And the thing about this is, this decimal number will go on forever and ever and ever and never end. It could be a job for the rest of your life to just keep finding more digits for the square root of seven. And what's even more difficult is that there's no pattern. Like you'll never find a repeating pattern that will finish out the rest of the decimal. Okay. Um, that's not always true. Like one third, if we do one third, well, there's point three three three. It repeats itself over and over and over and over. So we could say like how to write the whole thing out. Even though you could never actually write it out, you could say how you would. You'd write out an infinite number of threes after one decimal. So we'll talk about that more, about this being a, a, a non-repeating uh, infinite decimal. So, but back to our discussion, what numbers can be radicands? Well, whole numbers apparently work, even the square root of seven is the square root. There is some number out there that you could square and get seven. What about other numbers? Any problems with square roots? It's giving you back. Square root of seven didn't come up with two point six something. Calculators will, if you if you enter square root of seven and hit enter, all it will tell you is square root of seven. It's giving you the exact answer. I cannot write this decimal out and give you exactly what it is. So it's not giving you a decimal approximation. It's saying the exact square root of seven is the square root of seven. It's the number that if you multiply it by itself, you get seven. Okay? So it's just a mode that the calculator is on and we'll have to figure out how to take it off that mode in a bit. Okay. Let's back that up. Um, all right, how about the square root of 5.6? you think that exists? Is there a number that you multiply by itself to get 5.6? No, it doesn't exist. It's not possible. Wait, yes. I'm not asking you to find it. I'm not asking you to tell me what it is, but it's out there. Yes. There's some number, an infinite, unrepeating decimal as it might be. Yeah, there's a square root of 5.6. That's That exists. It's probably between, actually let's use a different number because we've already used a number that's between two and three. How about the square root of 35.62, right? Do you think that exists? Yes. Yeah. yeah, seems reasonable. And it's probably somewhere between, what do you think? Five. Five. Five and six? Yeah. Why? Five point seven eight two. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If I'm asking you to theorize about 
what this number might be close to, I'm not asking you to put it in your calculator and tell me what your calculator says. <laughs> okay? So this, it's not helpful for you. All right? Even if you get the answer and you say, oh, that makes sense. That's, that's nice, but I'm asking you for a second just to put down the buttons and the touch pads and the dip. Just give it a break. Let your brains think for a second. Why do you think? That this, that this number, the square root of 35.62, is between 5 and 6. This number, why is the square root of 35.62 somewhere between 5 and 6? Explain it to a 5 year old. Okay. Because if you just look at 35, uh -huh. uh, you can put 5 into 35. I forgot. No. <laughs> 7 times. Uh, but we're trying to find a number that multiplies by itself. You're multiplying 5 by a different I don't number. know. Why is a 5 year old thing? Okay, let's let's stay on task here. Stay on task. What's 35.62 close to? 36. And what 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 do I care about 36 and square roots? Six times six is 36. So 35.62 is close to 36. So some number close to six times itself must be 35.62. Really close to 36. All right. Um, so decimals are okay. Fractions are okay. How about this one? This is a pretty easy one. Nine sixteenths. The square root of nine sixteenths. Remember, all we're looking for, if we find the square root of nine sixteenths, that thing right there, we should be able to take it and multiply it by itself and get nine sixteenths. Yeah? How do you find a, de a fraction? I'm asking about, just think about multiplying two fractions together. They're identical. Getting nine sixteenths, what would that fraction be? So if you did like three fourths, so multiply three fourths by itself, multiply straight across on fractions. Three times three is nine, four times four is sixteen. There there is the square root of nine sixteenths also. Okay. So there's there are some numbers that just don't work. How about zero? Can you take the square root of zero? Is there a number that multiplies by itself to give zero? No. Zero. Every zero. Every no, 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 not times zero, no, no. times itself. Yeah. So zero times zero. Is zero, zero times zero. Zero times itself is zero, so the square root of zero is zero. But that's too many zeros. Um, it's just wrong. It's sixty. If we ever have extra time, which it seems like really unlikely in this class, sometimes we'll watch videos about stuff just like that. Right? Really good explanations about dividing by zero. Didn't we watch it in here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we already watched it in here. Well, then I already answered your question. Right? Yeah. Computer. It was like Anthony and Anthony. Because it was one of those up. So that would be like Anthony and Black Hole. $20. All right. Um, so what numbers can you not find the square root of? A number that... That if, if you took a guess over here and you try to multiply it by itself, there's no way you could get this number. 20. 20? Do you think there's, that doesn't exist, that a number can't exist that can multiply by itself and get 20? But it exists, right? Some number between 4 and 5? I mean, at the, at the very least, our, our, our weakest sense of intuition is to ask our calculators, and if you take the square root of 20, just in the interest of time here. It gives you something. It doesn't come up like there's no way I can figure this out. Here. Yep. Um, there. Can you put a negative one? Let's see. Negative four. Take a guess. What could be the square root of negative four? Negative. Okay, let's try two. I know. Except for I know that if I multiply two times two, I'll get four. 
wait, that doesn't work. Positive four, so that's no good. Are y'all paying attention? Let's use our calculators. Or are we just talking? Is it negative two? If it were negative two, and we're supposed to be able to take this number and multiply it by itself, exactly itself. Negative two, it'll be positive. So that didn't work either. And you think of a number that multiplies by itself and the result comes out negative. No, Derek? Question? Are you supposed to put a positive and a negative sign in front of it? Uh, that's a good question. You see that symbol and you wonder maybe that's the solution to this problem. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a minute. All right. So, so far, we have we found a solution? Have we found a number that can multiply by itself to get negative four? So far, no. Not any real numbers that we know of. Okay. So there are real, no real numbers that could possibly do this. Okay. Then, oh, wait. the only things that can be in the radicand or that can be the radicand are. Yes. You could, but then that just puts a negative there, and really what we're talking about is the square root, which we've talked about already, and then make that number negative. The square root of negative 4 is different from the negative square root of 4. Okay, these two are different. These two numbers are not the same thing. Because this just says, find the square root of 4 and then make it negative. What's the square root of 4? 2. It's 2. two. This number right here is 2. And there's a negative in front of it. So the answer is negative 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So it is the square root of 4. And it's negative. It's negative 2. So the only numbers that we can put in here are the real numbers that are positive. Okay. So this symbol right here is a, is a it's called a double barred R. It has two vertical lines. It means all the real numbers. Okay. And this positive means the positive ones. Okay. Not only the positive ones, but also zero. We talked about zero. Zero is not positive. It's not negative. So it gets its own classification. It is just zero. Okay. So these are the only guys that we can find the square root of so far within the real numbers. Okay. So let's talk about that real number thing. Or that, not that, that plus and minus thing that you just referenced. conversation that this room is having thinks it's the only one being had, but it's not. It's one of several, and it is distracting to me and to the people trying to pay attention. Okay. If you have a question, please ask me. It's going to save us a lot more time than you asking somebody else and having them try to explain it and you missing what I'm saying. You cannot multitask. We talked about that. Okay. So please ask me if you have a question. If you don't have a question about this, I don't know what you're doing. Why you would be okay. So let's talk about that plus or minus thing that Derek brought up. There's a this symbol. We're going to talk about what that means. So we're going to go back to the square root of 16, for example. The square root of 16 is a number that if you do okay, what's what does it mean? If you if you're the square root of 16, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, the number can times itself and get 16. Exactly. We said it lots of times, but it bears repeating again. So that number is 4, right? Because 4 times 4 is 16. Is that the only one that can multiply by itself to get 16? It's the only number that exists. Well, negative 4 times negative 4. Negative 4 times negative 4 also gives you 16. So since 4 times 4 is 16, and negative 4 times negative 4 is also 16, negative 4 also meets the definition of a square root. And so negative 4 also works, but not just negative 4, but also positive 4. So that's what that symbol is about. It's just saying the positive and the negative version of this number, you know, whatever in the context. In this context, it means that positive and negative 4 both meet the conditions for being a square root of 16. 
So does that only work with like numbers that aren't decimals that like can go into it evenly? Does it say that again? Like, okay, so you took like a number that has a decimal when you square, like get the square root of it. You take the square root, yeah. And you, you're just like not able to be like put in the, like when it's a write it down negative number. Uh -huh. So that only applies to weights. Okay, so the, the thing that you're saying, like the, the term that you're talking about is perfect square, right? So a perfect square, the, the square root is a whole number. That's what a perfect square is, it's a whole number, okay? So if it's not a perfect square, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. If it's not a perfect square, like um, you're talking about a decimal that just goes on forever, Yeah. this still applies. The positive forever decimal and the negative forever decimal both will give you that number. Well, I know this, this can be a confusing thing. Sometimes somebody will ask you, what's the square root of uh, 16? And you say 2. And somebody else asks you, some other math teacher, they say, what's the square root of 16? You say 4. And they say, no, plus or minus 4. Okay? So we'll, we'll try and sort this out as we solve equations and these things. But if you read the question, um, it asks for what's the, the square root, uh, or evaluate the expression, and then, um, let's see, let's say what I was looking for. Okay, let me try and distinguish between these two things. Um, If I say the square root of 16, I usually just mean, and when I say I, I mean people who write down the square root of 16 for whatever reason they write it down. They usually mean positive 4. Okay. But if we, have an if we have an equation like this, x squared equals 16, we want to solve for x. We want to find all solutions for x. Well, now it's a little more fuzzy. If I don't initially tell you that it's supposed to be negative, you can just assume it's going to be positive. But if you want to solve this equation, now what numbers work in place of x? 4 works. x could be 4. Could x be anything else and still work? x negative 4. x could be negative 4, so it could be plus or minus 4. So the number that got used and was squared to get 16, it's a little like I'm not sure. It's just a little up in the air. This, though, in most contexts is, well, it's clearly a positive number, right? Let's assume it's positive, square root of 16, which is 4. I know that that stuff can be, it's a little weird. I remember it being weird and confusing when I was in school, but um, most of the time, when we use the positive and negative, it's because we were specifically told that we wanted the positive and negative square root, like uh, in number 6 or number 8 or any of those. Or when we're solving equations, which we're not doing yet. Right? So uh, for now, if there's a positive in front of the square root, just say the positive. If there's a negative in front, say the negative. If it's positive and negative, say positive and negative. Okay? Just recognize that 4 and negative 4 both can be squared to get 16. That's the, the main thing that we want to know. So if I mention that later, you're not going to be surprised. So just um, one more thing about specifically like this lesson. Okay? So we have these perfect squares. Can anybody name a, 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 an example of a perfect square? Four. Is that? Four. Four is a perfect square. Four. Another one? Nine. Nine. Another 16. one? Sixteen. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Right, we can go on down the list. We can just keep squaring numbers. Until we die, so it'll take forever. We'll just keep squaring number after number after number. Okay? So let's call these non perfect squares. Squares. Give me an example of a non perfect square. Does it come out to be a whole number? 20. 20. 20. 11. 11. 7. 0.3. 0.3. 1. 1? 
Is there a number multiplied by itself to give one? Yeah. One, not one. One, so actually one is a perfect square. There's lots, right? Lots and lots of numbers uh, that are not perfect squares. Okay? Um, so what we call these, uh, when you try to take the square root of a number that is not a perfect square, all of them, and however many more you can list, are, let me try that again, are irrational numbers. Okay. So all non-perfect squares are irrational numbers, but it doesn't work the other way. Not all irrational numbers are non-perfect squares. Okay. Like pi is not some square root of some number. It's not a perfect square. It's defined differently. It's also irrational, but it's not the square root of some number. Okay. So yeah, perfect squares and non-perfect squares which are irrational. If you remember from previous discussion about this, is a, well, from almost the first day of school, we talked about the real numbers, the imaginary numbers, these ones, we're not going to worry about for a little while. But we talked about rational numbers, which we've been using exclusively up until now. This is our first real exposure to irrational numbers. We talked about pi, how that's irrational. And I mentioned to you briefly, square root of 2, square root of 3, square root of 7, square root of things that aren't perfect squares, they're all irrational. So that means, in this context, the decimals go on forever, and they don't repeat. If a decimal went on forever, but it repeated, we could write it as a rational number. Okay. What's a rational number again? To me, if a number is rational, it would be irrational. Not irrational, but rational. What kind of numbers are those? Underline this guy, ratio. That informs us about what kind of numbers these are. What kind of a number is a ratio? Or answer a different question. Ethan? What? Did you have oh. your hand? No. Uh, I think you're lying, but you know, it was almost up. It's really dangerous to post it being a raised hand. All rational numbers are for, well, another word that we could use would be fractions. When we were, when we were Did you say fraction? Yes, yes. You gotta shout that stuff from the mountain top so that I can hear you all the way up here. So it's a fraction. Whether it's an improper fraction or a proper fraction, uh, it works. It, if it's a decimal that terminates, like 0.5, we can represent it as 1 over 2. If it's a decimal that goes forever but repeats, we can find a rational representation of that. 0.6 forever is 2 thirds. Okay? You couldn't write it as a decimal exactly, because you'd have to write 6 as forever, but you could write it as a rational number, 2 thirds. But these guys here, square roots of non-perfect squares, are irrational. You, if you wrote them down in decimals, they would go on forever and ever and ever, and it wouldn't repeat. Please release all Thank you. And you cannot write them as a rational number. You cannot write uh, the square root of 2 as like 17 over 5 or something like that. That's not going to work. It'll never happen. Okay.
hope it'll be interesting to everybody, but it does involve a lot of math, what I'm going to tell you. But I'm going to share with you, uh, you know, part of my story so you can understand uh, where I come from and maybe what, what you guys can, what relationship you can have with that. So um, in middle school, I had a class that I didn't do very well in, a math class that I didn't do very well in. 3.7. Point six was last time. Two point seven. Okay. We'll address that later. Okay. So. I'm I'm going to try. If you guys don't care enough, I I won't. Cause I'm trying to share something personal, and if you don't care about it, that's fine. You guys can just. hearing things about what my teachers thought, I thought you might like to hear the same. So in middle school I had a class, a math, a, a math class I didn't do very well in, so I didn't really like math as going into high school. And throughout high school, I didn't really care about it. And then I got into college, I went to a junior college, and I started taking some math classes like in Algebra 2, Pre-Calculus. And in Calculus, I really, really started to enjoy math again, really loved it. Um, and then I did work, you know, I just had jobs and didn't go to school for a while and then moved up here and eventually started to go back to school. And uh, I took what was called a linear algebra and abstract math. And uh, not having taken calculus for a lot of years, I was a little intimidated, but I went in there and I, I did my best. And I really, just even more than calculus, really enjoyed uh, <coughs> two classes, abstract math and linear algebra. Um, and in abstract math, it was all about learning formal proofs, learning what it meant to write a proof. You'll write proofs in geometry, they're not really formal, they're more structured um, in a specific way to try and help you understand proofs a little bit. But I, I came to understand what real proofs were. They were actual paragraphs, sentences, words that, uh, that mathematicians used to prove things. Okay? So the reason I want to share it with you today is because it has to be experience too. And the square root of 2 is irrational. Okay. So, what does it mean again to say a number is rational? How could you write that number if it's rational? As a fraction, as one whole number, or as one integer over another integer. Okay. But it turns out the square root of 2 cannot be written that way. But if you think about it, in the, in the way that I thought about proofs before this class was, how could you really know that the square root of 2 can't be written as a fraction of some two numbers? Because maybe it's, this, it's some huge number that we haven't even discovered yet over some other huge number we haven't discovered yet. How do you know that won't happen at some point in the future? Okay? Maybe you can't know that. So, um, <coughs> to start out, I'm going to tell you how significant this fact is, or at least was to some people in the past. Um, so there was this guy called the Pythagoreans, is that some Pythagoreans, that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah? Trevor? Yeah, square plus B squared. Okay, so Pythagoras' theorem. Or the Pythagorean theorem or whatever. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Well, that's not true of all numbers, right? It's true of specific numbers as it relates to a triangle, a right triangle. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Here's a specific example. 3, 4, 5. So 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. 9 plus 16 equals 25. There's a specific example of a triangle that actually exists. 3, 4, and 5. Well, the Pythagoreans were actually a cult that Pythagoras was the leader of. Um, and one of the main beliefs that they had in their cult was that all the universe could be explained by either integers, right, that's positive or negative, like whole numbers, no fractions, that, stuff like that. For a fraction, it's always over one. Either whole numbers, integers, or a relationship between integers. And then that could explain everything. All right? uh, so here's a triangle, side of one. 
and another side of one. Okay, so if I was going to find this guy right here, this is A, say, this is B, this is C. <coughs> so A squared plus B squared would have to equal C squared. 2 would have to equal C squared. Right. So C must be this number, the square root of 2. Um, if they were to call, <laughs> this is going to sound really stupid, but um, like, did, were they just like kind of like a mathematic cult, or were they like, did they eat people? Did they eat people? <laughs> no. Or they just were a group of people who shared beliefs, they had a leader, and had they still exist today. Maybe in some small way. Trevor? Alright, so when you said like they believe the whole universe could be explained in like all that stuff, so they, uh, you're saying like they were like atheists? Um, I'm not saying that. I, I don't really want to comment about whether or not they believe in God or did it, but they just believe that, like, this stuff, stuff that you can measure in the universe, mm -hmm. could break down mathematically into whole numbers or relationships between whole numbers. Okay. Not that, like, 2 plus 2 equals Earth, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I don't know what their belief about a deity was, but it was that. Um, the, the beliefs about measurements of the universe can be explained as relationships of integers. Right? Okay. So, so here's this this triangle, this very crucial triangle, with one side is one and the other side is one. Two integers, two simple integers, one and one. And then here's this thing, it must be that this side of the triangle is the square root of two. So you would think, if you believed all this stuff about measurement and whole numbers and that kind of thing, that in a triangle that has a side one and a side one, that this one, must be some kind of relationship between two whole numbers somewhere in the universe. Some two whole numbers would have to exist to give you the square root of two. Okay? So that's what they believed. So come back to my story. The first proof, the formal proof I ever read was about the square root of two. And how it cannot be rational. Even if we go to the, the furthest, furthest distances of the furthest galaxy and find some incredibly huge number divided by some other incredibly huge number. We'll never find a pair of numbers that gives us the square root of two exactly. And so here's that proof. Um, if the square root of two is irrational, what we're saying is that the square root of two can be written as a over b. Where a and b are whole numbers, and also let's say that a, a over b is in simplest form. It means it can't be simplified. We can't cross out any common factors and get like a, a simpler version of a over b. So then we could square both sides. If we square both sides, square a square root, do we get 2? Square a over b, that's a over b times a over b. That'll give you a squared over b squared. You following so far? Yes. You want to hear this? Okay. I'm going to multiply both sides by b squared. That'll just cancel out this b squared. And I'll multiply this by b squared. So 2b squared equals a squared. So a squared is even, right? What's the definition of a number being even? What's that? Two numbers we go into. Right? Well, I guess like a number plus itself would be that number, or it's divisible by two as well. Is another way to say that. So a squared is even, which also means that a would have to be even. So a is even. And a is even means that a is equal to 2 times some number. That's the definition of being even. So what we'll do is replace a with this 2k. We'll just plug that right in there. And now we get 2k squared. So 2b squared equals 4k squared. If we multiply 2 times k by itself, 2 times k times 2 times k will give us 4k squared. If we divide both sides by 2, if b squared equals, and this cancels, 2k squared. So, so by the same reasoning up here, b squared is even, okay, uh, which would mean that b is even. So a and b are even. If A is even, it means it's divisible by 2. B is even, it means it's divisible by 2. It means A and B are divisible by 2. 
problem with that is way back here, we said that the square root of 2 is equal to a over b and that a over b was in its simplest form. But if that's true, then this is true, 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 which means this couldn't be true. So this being true means it can't be true. Okay? It's called a proof by contradiction. You assume one thing, and then you make logical deductions from that, and it turns out the thing you assume could not possibly be true if it were true. Oh, look at that. Okay? Well. So the original assumption was that square root of 2 could be written as a over b, where a and b are whole numbers, and it turns out it can't be. Because we just found out that if that were true, a and b would both be even, and we could find a simpler form. We could divide them both by 2 and simplify. Okay? So it was seeing a proof like that and realizing that we could prove things about seemingly unprovable stuff. I thought maybe there were some two numbers that could divide by each other and get the square root of two. But by the simple proof, just a few lines, some proofs are you know, hundreds of pages long, but this one is just a few lines, we've shown that the square root of two couldn't possibly be irrational. And that was really significant to the guy who was in the Pythagoreans and proved this and threw himself off the deck of a boat. He was so distraught, he found out. Because he found out that this triangle with a, an integer side and an integer side does not have a hypotenuse that is some ratio of two whole numbers, two integers. Uh, and not only that, this is, of course, thousands of years removed, so we can be sure that that guy did that, but it's, it's widely believed. And... Um, they were very secretive, they, didn't even, they never even wrote anything down, and uh, it's also widely accepted that the guy who let this slip, he let the, the non-Pythagoreans uh, in on this, he spilled the beans, they stranded him on a desert island to you know, suffer his fate alone because he had let this huge, huge fact out into the world, and now all the police and Pythagoreans are just crumbling. Yeah. Um. Oh, the dude who threw himself off the boat, did they ever find his body or did he just... That's what I'm saying. It was a long, long time ago. And this so they don't even know if he died. This is the sum of the story. We don't even know that he for sure threw himself off, but that's the story. Right? That's the story. What was he doing on a boat? He traveled by boat a lot. Anyway, uh, so it was it was that. It was, it was this proof and others a lot like it, that really got my fire burning for math again. And the thing about this is it's always, always true. It's always been true, even though we didn't know it. It always will be true, no matter what happens. Even things in science, we think we know them, and it turns out they're not true. Okay? We used to think that there was this stuff in outer space called ether, like it was stuff. There had to be stuff in space for light to go through get to Earth. It turns out there isn't. There's nothing in space. It's a complete, utter, absolute, perfect vacuum. There's nothing there. And the guy who proved there wasn't an ether with his really good experiment, he thought he had done something terribly wrong. He thought he kept doing the experiment wrong. He kept making it better and better and further proving over and over and over there is no ether. Right? So this thing we thought just had to be. It turns out there isn't. Right? We thought atoms were the smallest things, and we broke them apart. There was all this stuff inside there, then there was stuff inside that stuff, and we just keep finding smaller and smaller stuff. But with math, this will never not be true. You'll never prove this isn't true. It is true. The square root of 2, the number that we all could talk about and theorize about, it cannot be rational. It never will be. And that absoluteness was something that I really liked about math. Okay? And it's all theoretical. It's, it's you know... When will a cashier or uh, a lawyer or whoever use this? Never. Okay? But it's absolutely true, and that's what I love about it. Hildy? Oh. Um, so I was, I know this is kind of off topic, but when you said the space thing, uh -huh. I was wondering if you can answer my question. Um, in outer space, if you were to like breathe, like, like, would you just have the air sucked out of you, or could you like put a helmet back on and be fine? Terrible things would happen to you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> me, but I mean a normal person. Anybody. 
There's pressure, there's stuff, there's pressure in your body right now. And if you were in space and there was no pressure, zero, just it was an absolute vacuum, pressure inside, that's what happens when a balloon pops, because the pressure on the inside is too much, it's, it's way bigger than the pressure on the outside. Right? So, 